Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for this panel called Contemporary Asian American Activism, Building Movements for Liberation. My name is Catherine Michael, and I am an Associate Professor of Political Science at Ohlone College, and also one of the co-directors of the Lytton Center for History and the Public Good. Along with the two other co-directors, Dr. Kyle Livy and Dr. Heather McCarty, both professors of history, we'd like to welcome you and thanks you so much for joining us today. I will hand it over to my co-directors in just a moment to introduce our four panelists today, but we always like to start our presentations at the Lytton Center by sharing our mission with all of you. So I'm going to read that first. The Lytton Center considers ways that the study of the past can help shape the present and future. Our mission is to inspire the Ohlone community to work for the public good through programming focused on access, equity, inclusion, justice, and service. The Lytton Center explores challenges facing our community and the world, past, present, and future, and fosters big ideas that will inspire and transform Ohlone and the larger community for the better. Through training, programming, and capacity building, the Lytton Center empowers students to advocate for a just and equitable world. Thank you again for joining us. and I'll now hand it over for introductions. Hi, I'm Dr. Heather McCarty. And along with Dr. Kyle Livy, we get the incredible privilege of introducing the four amazing activist educators that are joining us today. And our plan is just to provide a brief introduction for each of our guests today before we hand things over to them so that they can educate us and open our hearts and our minds. And so I'm going to start with Dr. Diane Fugino, who is a press professor of Asian studies or Asian American studies at UC Santa Barbara and co-director in chief of the Journal of Asian American Studies. She is an author or co-editor of several books on Asian American um, and Black radical activism, including Contemporary Asian American Activism, Building Movements for Liberation, Black Power Afterlifes, The Enduring Significance of the Black Panther Party, Nisei Radicals, The Feminist Poetics and Transformative Ministry of Mitsui Yamana and Michael Yasutake, and Heartbeat of Struggle, The Revolutionary Life of Yuri Kochiyama. She works with UC, the UCLA Asian American Studies Digital Textbook Project, the UCSB Exito Ethnic Studies Teacher Training Project, and Cooperation Santa Barbara. And we are delighted to have her today. Uh, thank you, Dr. McCarty. My name is Dr. Kyle Livy, um, and um, thank you, Dr. Michael. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Catherine H. Lee. Um, Dr. Lee is a visiting assistant professor in the School of Education at Mills College. Her research recovers the overlooked history of writing instruction in ethnic studies and Asian American studies programs in higher education and examines how Asian American studies writing instructors have reconceptualized the work and politics of academic writing. Prior to joining Mills, Catherine taught in the writing programs at UC Berkeley and UC Merced and worked as a writing tutoring, tutoring program administrator at Lesley University the California Institute of Integral Studies, and Foothill College. And next, I will be introducing Pam Tao Lee, who is an Asian radical elder whose working class in San Francisco Chinatown roots led her to a lifelong journey dedicated to environmental justice. She's a co-founder of the Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco, Bay Area Agents for Nuclear Disarmament, Asian Pacific Environmental Network, Just Transition Alliance and International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines, US, and a contributor to the principles of environmental justice. In her nearly five decades of organizing and mentorship, she strives to uplift an ideology of radical love and resistance grounded in the practice of all power to the people, serve the people, internationalism, and women whose presence has taught her to act with generosity and courage. Welcome. Thank you. Oh, amazing. It's my honor to introduce Alex T. Tom. Um, Alex T. Tom is the executive director of the Center for Empowered Politics, a new project that trains and develops new leaders of color and grows movement building infrastructure at the intersection of racial justice, organizing, and power building. He is the former executive director of the Chinese Progressive Association in San Francisco and co-founder of Seeding Change. 
In 2019, Alex received the Open Society Foundation Racial Justice Fellowship to develop a toolkit to counter the rise of new, uh, of new Chinese American right wing in the US. And we're really honored to welcome all of you. I just wanna make a, a, a little plug. I put a link to this incredible new book, Contemporary Asian American Activism in the chat. Buy a copy today, <laughs> available at your local bookseller. Um, uh, and I'm really just, we're all very thrilled to welcome all of you to today to the Lytton Center. Glad to be here. Yes, really happy to be here. Thank you so much to Drs. Mitchell, Levy, and McCarthy, and to the Lytton Center. We're um, excited about the kind of work you do um, for history and the public good. And that's very connected to the kind of work that we hope our book does. Um, I'm Diane Fugino, speaking to you from the Chumash Lands and Waters of Santa Barbara. And I'm one of the co-editors of this volume, Contemporary Asian American Activism, Building Movements for Liberation. And you'll see that in this, that's part of what we're hoping to do. It is about talking about the different kinds of activism that's happening in Asian American communities and by Asian American activists. But ultimately, we do hope that it uh, it develops something that's transformative, that pushes back against power, and that gets us to a more liberatory world. We came together, my, my co-editor and, and I, Robin Rodriguez, because you know we had been, both of us, and, and actually everybody here has been an activist for many, many years. And um, I, I did work in the political prisoner movement inspired by some of my elders, like Yuri Kochiyama and Michael Yasutake and Mitsue Yamada, and more recently been really working um, to in it, the ethnic studies movement, um, not only at the university, but also helped to get ethnic studies as a high school graduation requirement in Santa Barbara, working with the Ethnic Studies Now Coalition. And because we had been working in the movements for years, we knew that there was a really rich history of Asian American activism and a lot of organizing taking place today. But during the whole, this is about 2017, this whole period in which there was an explosion of, of activism right in response to uh, police killings, um, the, the movement for Black Lives emerged, right? Uh, immigration activism, um, climate justice activism, uh, movements to cancel student debt, housing crisis uh, uh, developments, all kinds of things that were happening. And yet people knew almost nothing about the mainstream, that is, about Asian American activism. or And the two most visible um, campaigns around Asian Americans were actually right-wing campaigns to repeal affirmative action and um, to support a Chinese American police officer who had killed a, a black uh, a, a, a resident, a Kai Gurley, Peter Liang and a Kai Gurley. And so we really wanted to be able to counter that narrative that we think is shaped um, so strongly still by the model minority image of Asian Americans. And so we thought, well, what can we do to amplify the work of Asian American activists to center organizing knowledge? We thought it was so important to center the, the, the knowledge and the work of people who've really been building these movements across the long haul. And here we make a differentiation between activism, which we think is critically important, but it can involve things like attending um, demonstrations, meetings, organizing an event, um, reposting social media. But organizers think about how do we create change across the long haul, right? They think about strategies to change institutions, to uh, reject the status quo. And it's really crucial for organizers to involve people in the grassroots movement. Uh, Marian Kaba, who's um, quite prominent today as an abolitionist, says that in her book, right, if you're an organizer, then that means you must be working with other people. 
So we really wanted to center organizing knowledge and we were thinking about how can we do this? What might be one pathway that we would be able to do? And we thought an anthology, an edited book that includes multiple voices and perspectives would be crucial because there's already a lot on the internet, but you have to know how to navigate that to find Asian American activism. So we were hoping by putting out a book, people would see this. We started with a symposium at UC Santa Barbara in January of 2019, because we didn't want people just writing kind of from their own homes or workplaces. We wanted people to come together in dialogue with each other. And so we had a symposium that both uh, had public talks. Um, Pam Tao Lee, who we're so fortunate to have here with us, was our keynote speaker. And, um, and then we, um, we also, from that time, knew that we wanted to create an anthology and we um, did closed close door um, discussions about the state of Asian American activism, um, how we create change. Catherine Lee, who was a writing instructor and now a, a scholar, a, a researcher looking at writing programs, helped us think about how we can write um, all of this because writing is really hard. And so we have uh, 12 chapters in this and you know, the other panelists will speak to some of them, but I want to note that we also have chapters that I'm not going to run through all of them, but just you can see some of them on the Philippines and looking at how internationalism is so crucial to the work that we do here in the US and looking at ways that we can be in solidarity and support the kinds of struggles that are happening uh, worldwide. There's a, a chapter on uh, the New York Taxi Workers Alliance, which is primarily South a Asian drivers, and there's chapters on Southeast Asian um, organizing as well. Um, so anyways, I hope that you will check out this book. I will put a link in because our official or unofficial distributor is Eastwind's Books, who, which is an independent bookseller in Berkeley. And we really want to support to support independent booksellers. So let me turn it over then to uh, our other uh, panelists. Next, Pam Tao Lee. Hi, uh, I'm um, going to briefly introduce myself because um, Kyle read my or my uh, description or my description has already been read. <laughs> um, so and it, it's um, I've been asked to kind of introduce my own activism and a little bit about the chapter. And um, yeah, in terms of how did my activism begin, that's, that's often how people approach uh, this question. And well, for me, there actually isn't um, a certain moment, uh, but it's been a culmination of moments. And um, one was starting um, when I was a child and the experiences uh, that I had with my grandmother in Chinatown, uh, going with her uh, to work in the sewing factories when I was around seven years old and living with her in the various uh, single room occupancies in Chinatown, where we shared bathrooms with maybe up to eight uh, or more other families. And it's from my grandmother that I really learned how to engage with others um, in her own right. Uh, she was an organizer who really cared for her sister garment workers. Um, they, they would um, maybe have some problems in terms of uh, being too slow or the machine was broken or whatever. And, and she would be able to uh, advocate um, uh, on behalf of, of workers who, this, her sisters who were often in trouble at work. Um, and um, the, there, there are various incidents that I witnessed uh, in terms of the cruelty of the bosses in the garment factories. And my grandmother helped me understand what that, what that, what that meant um, to her. And I, I start this um, story off uh, in the chapter. And this chapter is followed then by a series of other, what I call radical love stories, uh, which for me fall into um, eradicating environmental racism um, here and around the world. And environmental racism, where people live, work, go to school, play, and engage in spiritual practices. So. That's a little bit about me um, and um, an introduce, introduction of how I got involved. 
Um, could you also tell? Oh, well, I guess your the chapter you have it does narrate your life, so I guess we we are good. And then we'll move to Alex. Tom, thank you so much um, to introduce your activism a bit more as well as your chapter. Hi, everyone. Good to see you all. I can't see you all, but good to be here. And I'm honored to be on this panel in this anthology and to be with my mentors like Pam Tali and, of course, Diane as well. And just a little bit about myself is that I'm born and raised here in the Bay Area. I'm, I'm in Oakland right now, but um, Ohlone land. And um, I'm born and raised in San Francisco, but at a young age, I moved to Fremont as well. So I'm actually very glad to be here on this panel and speaking to you all. And um, I got my start really in youth programs in high school. And I was very fortunate to get involved in high school and be active in youth programs, uh, specifically this program that was called the Encampment for Citizenship, which is still around. It's not here in the Bay Area anymore, but that is where I spent um, a summer, six weeks um, meeting Native Americans, Black folks, um, late Latinx, um, we call them Chicanos back then, other Asian Americans, poor folks, some um, white folks, and it really trans transformed my life. And so from that point on, I really had a commitment to racial solidarity. And that's really how I got involved. And um, I was at the Chinese Progressive Association and worked very closely with Pam. I was there for about 15 years. And it was at that organization, I had the privilege and the opportunity to be very embedded in the community, in the Chinese immigrant working class community. And, that, and I, I learned a lot from that. The chapter that I wrote is, um, is really close to me because it came from so many conversations with young people uh, who were in high school and also in college through a program that we started called Seeding Change, which is a program for young Asian Americans who are interested in community organizing. And I, it started with um, one-on-ones, um, meals, and then um, in the summer started to just have um, a lot of um, just really long conversations. And, um, and I would share a lot of my lessons and I would hear from young people as well. And, um, and so I wrote up that chapter because there's so much richness in, in all those conversations. And so I'm happy to share more, but um, just wanted to give a little bit of a taste of my chapter. And I'm gonna put in the chat um, the, the link to Seating Change. Thank you, Alex. And Catherine Lee? Hi, everyone. I'm Catherine. I'm so excited to be here. And thank you so much to the Lytton Center for, for hosting us. Um, so how I got into activism um, was actually through campus activism. Um, so as, a, as an undergraduate, um, when I was at Berkeley, I, I had the opportunity to um, to take an Asian American literature class, uh, which was not just a literature class, it was also a history class as well. Um, and that was sort of my introduction into finally uh, being exposed to the language that I needed in order to, uh, to be able to understand and articulate uh, some of the injustices that I had seen, uh, both in terms of my, you know, my, some of my family members um, who were uh, living in Chinatown and SROs um, and actually being able to understand that within a larger historical and political context. Um, and then later on taking Asian American history classes and uh, getting involved in um, uh, campaigns in order to, uh, to try to ensure that we had more Asian American instructors um, on campus because I was at a predominantly uh, white university for, uh, for graduate school at the time. Um, and then later on um, having exposure through campus activism in terms of organizing with um, with staff, with workers, with students, with faculty, um, as we fought against budget cuts and tuition increases that were disproportionately impacting workers of color as well as students of color. Um, and that just kind of, you know, progressed um, as I continued my education and, and as I became an educator as well, seeing these injustices, uh, realizing that Asian American studies was 
one of the many ways um, that I could learn how to contextualize this within larger contexts and, and have the language and theory um, and community um, in order to, to grapple with and try to address um, and create different visions for addressing uh, these, these structural problems. Um, in terms of the chapter that I wrote, um, you know, shout out to, to Pam, um, who, you know, was in dialogue with me um, as, as we were writing um, the chapters, uh, and also Eddie Zhang, um, whose work is also featured in this anthology. So my chapter is actually, um, it's, it's a reflection of, of the work that I did with Pam and Eddie as they were writing their chapters um, and reflecting on what it meant for me to actually be in dialogue. Um, with two incredible community organizers and longtime activists um, as they were writing and as they were thinking and reflecting on all the work that they've done um, uh, in their careers and in their lives uh, towards, for Pam, environmental justice, for Eddie, um, uh, you know, working to, to get ethnic studies um, uh, while he was in San Quentin. Um, and reflecting on what this actually means for writing instruction, because so much of writing instruction doesn't think about ethnic studies or using ethnic studies pedagogies to teach writing. Um, so I, I kind of reflect on that and what I've learned uh, from Pam and Eddie and Asian American activists about how we can teach writing in more revolutionary and, and visionary ways. Yeah, thank you, Catherine. Um, you know, our book, while it's focused on contemporary Asian American activism, really argues that contemporary today's activism cannot really be understood without understanding it in a historic context. And the most vibrant period of Asian American organizing, perhaps outside of today, was 50 years ago, the Asian American movement that began in the late 60s. And it began around issues like struggling for ethnic studies, um, the uh, 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 protests against the, 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 Vietnam, the US involvement in the war in Vietnam, right? Support for uh, prisoners, support for the Black Panther Party, um, uh, uh, getting food and housing and healthcare, I mean, into our communities. I mean, this may all sound familiar in ways and this type of mutual aid that people were doing um, also for many, like the Black Panthers, like the Asian American Political Alliance, like many of these groups, was really about ways to transform society. Yes, to provide services, but beyond doing just, just doing good, it was also to get people to think about the contradictions, the, the exploitation, the racism, the sexism in society, and think about how we can work together to create this kind of change. And we're so fortunate to have with us, right, Pam Tell Lee, who was, became active, right, as a mm -hmm. student at Cal mm -hmm. State Hayward in the late 60s, mm -hmm. and from there really um, helped to build the Asian American movement. And one of the things, the things that you were fighting in, Pam, was to establish ethnic studies and Asian American studies mm -hmm. on college campuses as part of the Asian American movement. And can you talk to us about why you and your colleagues were wanting to create ethnic studies and Asian American studies? What were the visions, questions, and needs driving this fight? And what contributed to its success? Okay. And maybe what else needs to be done? <laughs> Oh, okay. Um, well, yeah, that was about 54 years ago. Um, and I was a transfer student from San Francisco City College to Cal State Hayward. Um, and so I was just like new on campus. I was just walking around and checking out um, the various buildings. And, and I, I was walking in this one building uh, and saw that there was a, a meeting um, of what was called the Orioxy Club. Now, have you ever heard of something like that? Now, this is 54 years ago. It was called, it was the Oriental Occidental Club. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a sign on the door inviting people to join and come on in. And so I was curious and I, I you know, uh, walked in um, and they just happened to have um, uh, some students uh, from UC Berkeley um, that that was uh, making going to be making a presentation. So I sat in the back of the room, 
uh, and with and with this across from this other guy who was wearing a skirt. Um, his name was Louis Lee, and he and I became like lifelong friends. <laughs> but this club, um, their main focus was on social social stuff, um, dances, and and then they were actually talking about who they might run for Miss Chinatown, for example. And I'm sitting there going, hmm, this is not really that interesting to me. Um, but um, I stayed uh, for the presentation uh, from these two, two folks from UC Berkeley. And they were uh, talking about Asian studies. And none of us had a clue as to what they were talking about. Uh, and they kind of explained that um, they were on campus wanting to really uh, a challenge what was being taught on campus, especially around the history of uh, people, you know, contributions that have been left out in terms of what uh, the history of the US was about. And um, they started talking about issues of like um, the community and talking and, and saying things like, you know, we need to, to go back to community. And their mes message really resonated with me because like I mentioned earlier, I had spent in my early years, which really grounded how I came to look at the world and understand the world was with my grandmother. Um, and, you know, there was one day that I remember uh, sitting next to my grandmother's machine and then all of a sudden hearing a scream uh, from a garment worker and realizing how based on what the women were talking about that her hand had gotten stuck in a sewing machine and it was bleeding and the women were helping her uh, get her hand out of the machine when the the boss came storming in and he stormed right past me uh, and he started yelling at everybody to go back to work uh, and uh, uh, the women ignored him which was really amazing and they continued to care for the woman and took her away, I probably to the hospital. But my grandmother pointed to him and said, did you see that in Chinese? Again, uh, did you see that? And then I said, yes, I, I saw that. And she said, did you know what just happened? And I said, no, do you know who he is? And I said, he's the boss. And he said, and do you know why he is why he is? And I go, no. And he says, because he's mean and he's greedy. And that was one of my first lessons in terms of grounding, in terms of an analysis that would carry me for life. And so when I met students like Carolyn Wong from UC Berkeley, now a lifelong friend, she and others were demanding that we create an Asian studies that would equip us uh, as students on campus to go back to return to community. And it resonated with me because this was what I wanted to deal with, with what I experienced and saw with being with my grandmother in the in the single room occupancies and other experiences. And I felt that um, what they were saying is in terms of really challenging the status quo in terms of the white West framing of US history uh, and, and the role of the US in the, in the world was something that hmm, just at that moment, Diane has already kind of flashed on the, 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 the political moment at, during the late 60s with the Black Power movement, with the, the movements for colonial national liberation struggles in Asia, um, that these things were what I wanted to get engaged in. So ethnic studies, we worked, we found professors on campus who were supportive of what we wanted and we work together uh, and how we work together. This is the second part. There's the, the one is the demand for an ethnic studies, Asian studies. But the second part is the organizing and the formation of, of uh, groups like the Asian American Political Alliance that would hold, um, we would have a base of students that together with the, with the professors demand from the administration, we would have a voice uh, and power and to create that power to impact and, and create these studies, as well as a forum in which we hold the professors accountable um, to us in terms of how the, how the classes would be designed, what kind of classes we would offer, et cetera. So um, these are two 
two components I feel is really important. And the third thing that came out of campuses I feel is missing today is campus and university connections. Being able to have um, uh, uh, those kinds of authentic ties in which students are able to engage with communities as equals um, and to not come in with a missionary you know, perspective, parachute in, but really engage with the front line and help facilitate what the issues are and help facilitate the creation of power that is broad. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Pam. Um, Catherine and Alex, I'm wondering if you could speak to the ways in which this movement, this powerful Asian American movement of 50 years ago has shaped your own consciousness and your own activism. And I think we'll start with Catherine. Yeah, so I, I think it's it shaped my my consciousness and, and my work in, in many ways. I think most recently, you know, working, having the opportunity to work on this anthology and to be in dialogue with Pam and, and Eddie um, has really changed the way that I think about in the university today. Um, so I'm realizing that so much of what the Asian American movement um, and its leaders uh, and participants actually envisioned, of course, have, have not come to really pass, especially in writing programs, which is where I'm situated, um, and education programs where I'm currently situated. Um, as I was talking with, with Pam and Eddie, you know, one of the things that I realized was that we, we need to understand our history in order to uh, imagine uh, where we want to go in the future, um, and also to understand our current circumstances. Um, so being in, in dialogue um, with members of the Asian American movement, people like Pam, who actually were a part of it, um, and who started the Asian American movement, um, I, I think has really changed the way that I, that I understand what's happening right now. Pam was saying earlier that, you know, if, that she was a student activist over 50 years ago. Um, and still some of the questions that Pam has talked in other, um, you know, in other places about, you know, the kinds of questions that they were asking, the kinds of things that they were testing, they're things that I see myself and my colleagues questioning and, and testing. We're, we're asking similar questions. We're, we're still trying to figure out uh, the answers to some of those questions that were posed 50 years ago. And we're also recognizing that, you know, even though we're in this moment of diversity, equity, and inclusion, it strayed very far from uh, some of the um, some of the visions of, of the Asian American movement. Um, I think, in another sense, uh, in terms of my own campus activism, you know, I've I've had the great uh, opportunity to actually be able to organize uh, with some of these veterans of the Asian American movement. So when I was at Berkeley. Um, teaching at Berkeley, you know, we were, we were fighting against uh, cuts to Asian languages on campus. And one of the demands of uh, ethnic studies in the late 1960s was that Asian languages um, needed to be a part of students' education so that they could read uh, history, they could read literature in their original language, and they would have the language to actually be able to go back to their communities That's and right. learn their histories, to talk with their elders, to learn That's from right. their elders. That's right. um, so many of those fights uh, from the 1960s, 1970s were continuing to happen when I was working at Berkeley, and I had the opportunity through organizing with people like Ling Chi Wang, um, and Elaine Kim, to, not just to see what it was like to be able to organize uh, with them, but also to recognize that for them, this, this wasn't like a one-time thing that they were doing. This was a fight that they had been in uh, for decades, um, and it continued to evolve and change and shift and manifest in different ways. Um, but that helped me to realize that, you know, the work that we do in the university, it's all a part of this ongoing legacy. That's right. Thank you. And Alex, how has the movement? Yeah, your... I love this question. And I'm glad that Pam went first because in a lot of ways, Pam has been such an important influence for myself and my own 
personal transformation. And as you all were talking, the thing that just kept coming up to me was that quote that no history, no self. And, um, and really the way that we need to understand history to know ourselves, like for me, it shaped me, like literally shaped my personal transformation. And in another context, like if people understand the matrix reference, it's like the, the red pill, you know, it's like, it's like once you learn your history, learn yourself, in a lot of ways, there's no turning back. And, you know, I talked about getting involved in high school. I, I grew up very socially awkward, um, introverted, and, and also growing up in Fremont, um, I was called chink, jap, gook um, all the time. And that might be a little bit weird to hear, but that was like in the 80s. So I'm, I'm 46 this year. And so just really thinking about me needing that kind of self-confidence and to value myself, those are the building blocks of what builds a movement. Because so many of us are oppressed and racialized in different ways. And what the movement does and what the Asian American movement did is to really tie us all together that it's not just about Asians, not just about Chicanos or black folks, but we're trying to transform society. But I grew up thinking it was very odd and I was actually called, you're like a really weird Asian. And this, it, you're like one of those Bay Area Asians, you know, and, and really I found family in the movement, right? And I, I wanna share this one story that after this um, high school camp I went to, I went back to high school and I went to high school at Mission San Jose High School, which some of you who are in Fremont know of it as a very elite uh, school for a lot of Chinese people. Well, um, it was less elite back then, but it was definitely, definitely very conservative. And I went to, um, basically I said, let's, let's do an assembly and let's do an event, um, multicultural day, which is very basic, you know, people sharing food of their different cultures. And then I said, we should do a Malcolm X, Martin Luther King unity day. And that one was a little bit more, <laughs> people were like, what are you talking about here? And so I invited all of my friends from this camp I went to in, in, in Oakland and they came to my high school and they did a workshop on, the, um, on ethnic studies. And it was an ethnic studies curriculum. And they talked about, you know, Christopher Columbus, slavery. They talked about um, really the need for ethnic studies. And that was like my first political act. I didn't know I was doing a political act, but it, but because of the movement, it made me have confidence to even do that. And, and that was the red pill because I took that action and I had um, the white kids from the wrestling football team uh, beat me up and really just target me. And they were, and what they said was very interesting because they had elected me to become the ASB president. They said, we didn't think you were going to be this kind of an Asian. And I was like, wait, what, what, what are the kinds of Asians? And they're like, you're saying things that not Asian people are supposed to say. And I, and, and again, this is what I mean. It's like, because I took that action and then the reaction that I got made me realize how important it is for Asian Americans to stand with other people of color mm -hmm. for transformation. Mm -hmm. And so really, I wouldn't have done that if I didn't know that there are other people like Pam and, you know, other people. And it wasn't, and I always learned this, it's like, it wasn't like there was a, a lot of people, there were a lot of people on the streets, but it was a committed core of people who were organized, right? And the way that they stayed in this thing for so long, like 50 plus years, they had a vision, but they're also very caring for each other and caring for themselves. And I think the, so, you know, now I'm 46 and I'm in this place where I want to really carry on these kinds of lessons and talk to young people about this. And I have a seven-year-old and apparently seven-year-old is part of the Gen Z or Gen Gen Z or whatever generation, um, it's like carry for this lesson, right? If you can take care of yourself, the people around you and have a long-term vision, that is really how you stay in this for the long run.
Thank you all. I mean, this is this is really powerful what what you're saying, Alex, in terms of people saying, you know, you don't seem like other Asians, right? Which is an implication of what what is a is a standard Asian or what is a typical Asian or how do we imagine Asian Americans? I guess because I've been in the movement a long time and in Asian American studies. I mean, most of the Asian Americans who I know personally and interact with personally are very justice minded, engage in solidarity, are activists, but this is still not the image. And this is what we're hoping that our book will change. Um, there's much to talk about, about the Asian American movement. And so I want to say to those um, in the audience, thank you so much for being here. And also if you have questions, please put them in the q and I think is where you're supposed to be, they're, they're supposed to go um, because this is a webinar. So please, um, any questions you have about the Asian American movement, that was a transformative mo period in US history. It was a paradigm shifting change, right? People started demanding self-determination, right? Being in today's parlance, unapologetic, right? Not just trying to fit in and, and um, not that people were just doing that before, but there was a shift and it changed people's consciousness. And I see today as another one of those qualitative shifts, those paradigm shifts. And so there's so much to talk about what's happening in, in the Asian American movement right now. But I want to turn to another question. Um, and, and so please, you know, raise whatever you'd like um, for, for, for the panelists. But I, I want to turn to another another question which has to do with relationships you've all talked about. You've all talked about the importance of relationships. You've all narrated how you came into consciousness because of people around you, how you deepened your commitments because of people around you. In Pam's introduction, it was so beautiful talking about how women around her, through them, she developed generosity, a spirit of generosity and courage. And I can tell you myself that I get so much more courage from other people. Otherwise, it is scary. Sometimes you think you're going to get targeted. And so I'm wondering, and I think I'm going to start with you, Alex, because you, you talk about this so much in your chapter, right, about the importance of relationships and also the, and so I want to think about the social as it's linked to the political. So that also leads us to thinking about the um, importance of care and self-care, right? And you talk about the ways that sometimes self-care is seen as selfish care, but you think see it very differently. So I'm wondering if you could speak to either self and collective care or the importance of social relationships in terms of political organizing and activism. Yeah, I'm just gonna build off of um, what I shared before, which is part of movement building is about taking care of yourself, your community, and society. And I'm just going to read a little bit from my chapter, actually, because I was just like, oh, I can talk about it. But um, I have a section around practicing self and community care. And what I write is that self-care can has been misunderstood and mischaracterized in the movement. For a full transformation of yourself and society, we need to balance the individual and collective needs. But this requires us to be aware of our needs and to have much stronger systems of community support. So this tendency, and I fall prey of this all the time, is, is that we tend to isolate ourselves when we don't know what to do. We tend to burn out and we don't know how to ask for help. Like if we ask for help, we feel like we're weak or that we should know better. Since so un unintentionally without really considering the needs of the people around us, sometimes we, we leave and we just kind of drop off and don't tell anyone what's happening. So self-care sometimes leads to selfish care without even knowing it. And we're all subject to this, right? Under capitalism, we know things are not gonna change anytime soon. So we are fed a lot of individualism. So how do we counter isolation is, is really important right now. And that's why self-care is community care. And so just the point on this, the finer point around this is that the self and self-care is the subject, not the practice. 
like you are talking about yourself, <laughs> but it doesn't mean to heal yourself. You can only do it by yourself, if, if that makes sense. I'm, I'm trying to practice if that makes sense. So, so yeah, too often self-care turns into isolation, being alone, shameful. Like I hear a lot of young people saying, I'm going to leave until I'm fully better. And I'm going to come back. Or you think oh, something's wrong with me. I'm going to fix myself. And then I'm going to come back in. But under capitalism, it just turns into selfish care. The only way to break and to counter capitalism is to work with other people to take care of yourself. And, and yeah, and having and real self-care is having community care. I'm wondering if Pam or Catherine would like to weigh in or add to this and, you know, sure. in, in whatever ways you'd like to think about the importance of social relations to, to movement building and to activism. And also, you know, how do we build, how do we, how do we create these, right? This kind of collective care. Um, right now, um, this, I hope this doesn't seem a little bit too random, but um, following on what Alex talked about, self-care. Um, in this moment where there's just, we're just being inundated with just so much chaos in the world and you know, there's a war going on, there's an anti-Asian violence of which I was, I was subjected to myself. Um, there's just um, the pandemic. So um, what I have been doing over the past several months is to learn how to um, meditate, uh, to train myself to really um, be able to get rid of all of this chatter that's coming in from media and social media and other things. Um, and, and to be able to um, be able to focus um, through meditation, deep breathing skills, to be able to like then clear my mind and then become much more aware through those practices of what is really going on. And, and part of it is in terms of the self-care is really also learning how to love yourself, to know who you are, to have compassion, not only for the world, but for yourself. So for me and Alex and others, I think on the phone call, we have we come step forward the, for this because we have compassion for others. We want to serve the people. We want liberation for all the people. And so that is something that if you wanna really, for me right now to be able to step forward in that way is that it has to start with a love of yourself and an understanding and an awareness of yourself and to be able to bring all of that together in a way in which then you can step forward with an, an awareness. And sometimes I have to say, back in the day, a lot of where we came from was a lot of like um, a certain ideology, a certain way of looking at the world. and that, and. And as I have learned is that that was diff with different eras, with different generations, with different kinds of spaces, you have to let loose some of that. And to be able to really um, focus in on what is present with you right now. So to honor the legacy of the past, have it help inform you, um, but be able to integrate that with what is actually going on right now. So. I know it's kind of, I don't <laughs> want to, you know, um, too metaphysical, but for me uh, in this, as I age, uh, I have been called on more as an elder and, and more questions have been asked of me by intergenerational spaces. And I really mm, need to be really, try to be relevant and present for them, yes. Yes, absolutely. Uh, Catherine, <laughs> I don't know if you wanted to weigh in on this one or move to the next question, whatever you would like. I mean, I, I think Pam and Alex uh, did an incredible job of, of offering recommendations. So why don't, why don't we move to the next question? Yeah, 
Our next question, our, our, the final question that I have for the, the panelists, um, and then we're gonna open it up to Q&A from the audience. So I hope that there are questions. I, I can't see them, um, uh, but, but uh, they're to be placed in the Q&A. But my last question, you know, we're, we're really, we're talking about young, the youth activism, the activism of students, the activism of young people, whether this was, the 60s and 70s, right? The, that Asian American movement. And also today it is young people who are really kicking things off, really sparking what's happening. Um, and so I'm wanting to ask, um, you know, everybody about kind of what we see as the role, the work, the significance of young people in terms of creating transformative change also, what's the role of intergenerational right uh, knowledge and 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 experiences and interactions as you have all been talking about? And Pam, Pam, I'd like to start with you. And I want to ask you a question, <laughs> which is because I know you always you really bring this relational leadership, this way of working in the movement that's always about talking to people, listening very closely, consulting with people. And as you did do this, you also listen to what their questions are. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you, what kinds of questions do young people and the people you organize with um, are, what are, what kinds of questions are they asking? Mm. Oh, thank you. Thank you for asking that. Um, well, a, a lot of questions, you know, young people will come over to our house and we might go for a walk and, and when we go for a walk, they'll ask questions. And most of a lot of times they'll say, how do you talk to you? How did you talk to your parents? How did you relate to your parents? Uh, they're, you know, they're active and um, a lot of times they don't tell their parents what they're doing um, or they're, they, they have, but their, their parents are like not really supporting them. Um, another that I'll get is, um, uh, there's just a few of us on campus that that care about this. this. There's not that many of us, and 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 there's and how did you get so many people to 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 get involved and in, and in whatever? So it's 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 I think a lot of people feel a lot of young people feeling like isolated or sometimes in the, in the work that they're doing. Um, another would be around um, in terms of uh, an Asian perspective on things. Well, actually. I kind of offer it from some of these questions, but like, um, what is an, an Asian, pers Asian American perspective on such and such of a thing? Is there an Asian, what do we bring to all of this anyway, as Asian Americans in, 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 in uh, the work that we're doing? Um, some of the young people know that I was um, a, a, a victim of an anti-Asian violence thing, and they'll, they'll ask me how I felt about that. Um, so this, that's, that's a few, um, of the things that, that they might ask me. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I don't know, Pam, if you, if there's any one of those questions that you would like to address right now, or, you know, or, and, or do we just open it up to the audience after, after, um, Alex and Catherine have a chance to weigh in on the role of youth? Um, and then see if they, if any of those questions resonate and people are asking them back. Oh, and I forgot what, one of my opening questions that I start my chapter with is with, with Monica when we were having lunch and she said, she leaned over and said, Pam, what do you think what we should do about the climate? Um, so of course there's things like that, but yeah, I'll, I'll turn it over to Catherine and Alex. Okay. If you're interested in any of those questions, please mm -hmm. raise them. I have to say that Pam Tal Lee was involved in the whole transformation of the environmental justice to include mm -hmm. struggles against racism. Some of this work was really at those national um, people of color yes. uh, conferences that were happening in the 90s. And so there's a lot of good questions there to ask her. But let me ask, um, Alex and Catherine, if you would like to weigh in on thinking about the significance of youth in organizing and the kinds of contributions and maybe limitations as well. I think Catherine should go. Okay. Um, 
so I, you know, I, I, um, I, I teach. Uh, so, so I work with with a lot of students. Right now, I'm working with with older students, um, you know, who are working professionals. Um, but I, I spent many years uh, teaching undergraduates, and they were often the ones who were pushing me uh, to do things, to get involved. Um, I, I remember there was one student in my writing class at Berkeley. Um, and we, we kept in touch after that student had finished with my class. Um, and I remember receiving an, an email one summer uh, from this student and it was a very long email. Um, and he had just finished the, the Eva Lowe Fellowship Program at the Chinese Progressive Association, which is the organization that Pam co-founded and that Alex um, uh, was, was director of. Um, and he said, Catherine, you, you, you have to check this out. Like this changed the way that I thought about things. This, um, it inspired him to begin taking Asian American studies classes. It, it inspired him um, to start doing writing that wasn't just analyzing text, but to actually do political analysis of text. I, I think he became an English major. Um, and seeing how that changed him and changed the types of questions that he was asking. Um, and for him to, to tell me, I think you need, to, you need to look into the Chinese Progressive Association. That really pushed me both as an instructor and as a person uh, to reach out to, you know, to see if there was an opportunity to volunteer and also to really critically examine my own teaching and to think, okay, what can I do as an instructor in this writing program um, to begin teaching materials that actually will speak to the questions uh, that my students have, to the interests that they actually have, while also, you know, helping them to, you know, learn how to do this writing thing that they're supposed to do in order to, in order to graduate. Um, but I also think one of the things that they, that they've taught me is that, uh, you know, youth have, they have incredible insights and visions uh, for the future, but in doing campus organizing, I've also realized that uh, part of the reasons that they're able to develop these incredible visions is because they're always in dialogue with others. Um, so in 2008, 2009, 2010, uh, you know, the recession had happened, there were a series of budget cuts that the University of California system was going through. Um, and I be became involved in a student and worker um, uh, activist group. Uh, mm -hmm. So this was comprised of students, it was comprised of workers on campus, so staff on campus, mm -hmm. and also instructors. Um, and what I realized was even though the students were the ones who were kind of like doing a lot of the legwork, like, you know, reserving the room so that we could have meetings or figuring out, um, like, you know, creating sign up sheets so that we could sign up for different tasks and kind of doing all of that organizational work. Um, they were really looking to the workers on campus, uh, like the AFSCME workers on campus, mm -hmm. you know, who, who are the groundskeepers, who are the janitorial custodial staff, um, to actually help them work on the political analysis, right? Like, what are the questions we need to be asking? What are, what are the problems with the ways that the administration is running things? Mm -hmm. How is this impacting workers? Um, how is this impacting the most vulnerable? So... The youth were actually, the youth, the, the students, they, they were really, um, I think, showing what it meant to, to have this kind of intergenerational dialogue that Pam and Alex talk about uh, in their chapters and what it means for them to take on particular leadership responsibilities, but also to recognize that they, um, that we come to better analysis, uh, better solutions, better paths for moving forward. Um, by being in dialogue and being in conversation with others who might have different experiences or who might bring in uh, different perspectives and insights. Yes, absolutely. And I think your, your response, how you started this off with your own personal um, story about uh, CPA leads us directly into Alex. And um, Alex, if you could speak to you know, you've worked with young people for many years as the executive, former executive director of the Chinese Progressive Association, right, um, with the Eva Lowe internships and also seeding change. And 
if you could speak to the kinds of things that you've learned and seen. I'm going to share a quote that I've also put into the, the chapter, but it's a quote that Pam read. I don't know if you remember, you read this quote about from Happy Lim, mm -hmm. and it was an, at an alliance meeting, and it was about the role of young people. Mm -hmm. And the quote goes, these revolutionary minded youth who were advanced in thinking had an unshakable determination faith. I follow the advanced youth. And, you know, I, Pam probably does a lot of these kind of things, but dropping this kind of lineage of how every generation, how do we become an activist, organizer, a leader, and become stewards of leaders. And that is all part of organizing. And so the role of young people historically have been about moving, like pushing us all to think bigger and think about alternatives and to really believe. And that is the role of young people. And it's not just young people alone. We need stewards to be able to open up those doors and also to provide them mentorship. And, and I think that's what I learned a lot. And more, more particularly, and there's one question that gets into this is like, what's, what's the kind of um, next kind of set of issues? I think young people are very clear that the climate and the world is, it, like capitalism is unsustainable. That is, to me, <laughs> a way more clear understanding than like I was like growing up with, right? You know, you can know that capitalism is bad, but now people are like, we may not be able to inhabit this, this, this world, right? The, the world actually will continue to survive. It's been around since whenever, right? It's like the, the people who are inhabiting and the, the, you know, the plants, whatever, it's just, we have um, a, a big contradiction in front of us. And I feel like young people are very clear about that. I think the challenge around it is what I was getting to on my other question was like the feeling of isolation, fatalism, defeatism, like nothing is possible. And I think that's where intergenerational is really important and what I tell a lot of young people is that we're here to steward your leadership and we're here to support it and to give you very real talk when we don't agree. But young people, it's their, it's their leadership right now to figure out some of these big questions like the role of China. What do we do with digital organizing, social media organizing, organizing during COVID? Um, all of these big questions, um, climate, all of these big questions, it's the leadership of young people who are going to really figure that out in partnership with um, myself. I consider myself as a yelder, right? <laughs> to the yelders, to the elders, in, in a way that's multi-generational. Thank you all. I understand that there are questions in the Q&A. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. There are, we have, we actually quite a few, and we're very mm -hmm. excited. Um, mm -hmm. I had the first, I want to say, before we jump into the questions, um, how deeply honored we are, I'll speak for myself, I'll speak from the eye, how deeply honored I am to learn from all of you today, and to continue this conversation in the Q, with the Q&A. Um, I also want to call attention to something I put in the chat. The Lytton Center, if you're a student, um, here today, live listening to this talk and watching this um, discussion, and you're interested in getting a copy of the Contemporary Asian um, American Activism book, we will give it to you for free. Um, so you can send an email to Lytton Center at aloni.edu. This information's in the chat. Um, we'll purchase the book from East Wind. So we wanna make sure that everyone, um, all of our students who wanna learn more from this incredible body of activists can do so. Um, and we're very excited to share that opportunity. Um, and to those faculty and staff, maybe we can hook you up too. We'll see. <laughs> maybe if you're nice to me, I'm just joking. Okay, we probably will. So we do have some questions and- um, Yes, uh, I see them. 
Catherine, Heather, and I will, will go through them. And I'm going to ask the first question. Um, and that is, as Asian American communities continue to diversify, given the changing ways of migration, how do you approach the political act of identifying who belongs and who does not within the Asian American community? How do we make sure not to reinforce colonialist slash imperialist taxonomies of race and identity? Um, and Alex already took a, uh, a stab and, and started responding to this question, but I wanted to throw it out um, to, to Alex again and to everyone else in case folks did not see that in the Q&A. I think Pam and Catherine should go. <laughs> I, was, I was trying to answer the questions, but um, yeah. Um, I, I'm, I was looking at some of the questions and <laughs> that one is a little bit too complex for me. <laughs> I can't answer that one. I, I just know that there's a lot of breakdown and, and, and you know, groups wanting to be recognized and, and, and stuff, but I'm not, I don't feel prepared to act, answer that one. I don't know if Catherine I would uh, be happy actually to weigh in on this yes. one a little bit uh, on this. And, you know, I'm speaking about this from an Asian American studies perspective, because th there is the question of who belongs to Asian America, right? Who, what constitutes Asian America? And in the 60s and 70s, when the term was coined in the group, Asian American Political Alliance, right, that Pam was part mm -hmm, of. Mm -hmm. um, it was Yuji Ichioka who's credited with coining this term as a very political term, as a pan-Asian term. It was not common for Asian Americans to work together politically at that time. It was a strategy against racism because we were seen as all looking alike. It was not saying that our cultures and histories were alike, our languages, our religions were alike. It was not saying that. And the other thing it was, it was third worldist as well, because people were really linking to the anti-colonial struggles in the third world, um, in part because of the Vietnam movement, but also beyond that. And so I think if we hold on to that term, I, I guess I'll answer this in a couple of ways. If we hold on to that, right, what is Asian America, right? Is it, is it just an identity, right? Is it a political formation? If it's partly a political formation, and people will define it differently, absolutely. But from the perspective of Asian American studies, as I understand Asian American studies, and from the perspective of the Asian American activist movement, and from the perspective of something like our book, Asian American is deeply political, and it is striving in various ways to think about the ways that racial capitalism, heteropatriarchy, <laughs> you know, yeah. colonialism all work together in the ways that Alex was talking about, right? We cannot make transformative change without addressing and critiquing these systems. Um, so that's one way I would answer that. But another way is, you know, it's, it's a really fluid, Asian America is a very fluid rubric and um, it's an umbrella term. It's never perfect. Terms change over time. Um, and within the Association of Asian American Studies, there has been different pushback and one of the pushback currently is where do Southwest Asians, right? And North Africans possibly even, but especially Southwest Asians fit within the, the Asian American rubric. And it's a question that's actively being considered. And in fact, I guess I'll give a little push. Um, if you go to our website, you, you will see that we have a call to look at SWANA Southwest Asian North African studies and its relation to Asian American studies. So it pushes back against that. And I. If I could say one other thing because of the way the question was raised, you know, Native American, Native Hawaiian studies and indigenous studies also reshape Asian American studies through the lens of settler colonialism. Yeah. And that really important book, right, by Candice Fujikani and Jonathan Okamura, um, Asian Settler Colonialism, helps us to think about what, what are our paradigms that we should be working with and how can we think about Asian immigrate, Asian American liberation in relation to indigenous peoples, for example, or blacks. I hope that helped. That's a fantastic response. And I fully plan on excerpting that for my queer studies class when we talk about who comes under the queer umbrella, because it it is, it addresses this idea that I think other identity groups wrestle with, right? And ideas about inclusion and terminology and 
and I love how you tied this to this idea of activism and politics, that these are politicized terms and political movements. Um, so it's really fantastic. It's a really, it was a very cogent, excellent answer. Thank you. It's a nice, nice thanks for the help. I will definitely <laughs> be using that. Um, do any of the, Catherine, did you want to speak to that, Dr. Lee? No? Okay, yeah. She kind of hit it out of the park, huh? She, that was pretty good. <laughs> but excellent. Thank you. Um, okay, so I have the next question. Um, and again, I would like to just echo Kyle and say thank you all so much for this fantastic panel. Um, this question comes from an audience member and it says, for any of the panelists, how do you deal with mostly conservative Asian American community members who have a just us mentality and push against a justice framework? <laughs> Alex. 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 Yeah. <laughs> I guess I'll take That's that. an Alex question. Yeah. I love this question. This actually gets to the other one the counselor was asking too. Mm -hmm. I think for me, this gets into the compassion for yourself and other people. And I, I want to distinguish the, and I would say Asian American, but I would say like specifically, I'll speak on behalf of the Chinese American community that's very conservative and many are in Fremont. <laughs> so um, we need to distinguish the ones that are, that have like um, a right wing coordinated response that have political and personal interests to advance themselves. That is a grouping, and I would say a very vocal minority of people who are influencing people who are just conservative, right? And again, under capitalism, under the ways that capitalism divides different communities of color, and then you have class in there. So, so Asian Americans who are middle class, Chinese Americans who are middle class in Fremont are going to be quite conservative, right? Now, now those people... I would just argue are people we can talk to and that we should talk to and learn to talk to and move. But we need to distinguish because like I do research on the Chinese right wing and I'm very clear to say it's a very small part of the community that is like actually right wing. Other people like my my parents who have grown very progressive actually since um since um I'm their child <laughs> so that that they are just conservative. And it's because many of us don't know how to talk to them. And some of it is a language barrier. So I literally went to China for a year to brush up on my Mandarin and my Cantonese. I wanted to, I wanted to speak like fluently and, and I end up coming back being able to do that. And it just really took a approach of compassion and being able to actually try to talk to them. And not in a way where I knew the answers and they didn't. Because many of our people in this Chinese immigrant community, they went through the Cultural Revolution in China. They went through many experiments, many um, fits and starts with the, the revolution in, in China, right? And so they actually know a thing or two about revolution and about social change. And there's a difference but when someone says something like, I just don't agree that change should happen or they don't believe it's possible. So, so when you're talking to people, I'm like, oh, wait, I, cause my mom even said that, like I, I work at this Chinese progressive association and she's like, you're just not gonna change everybody. So what's the point? That's very different than saying, I disagree that change should happen, right? And I think those are the kinds of nuances of, um, when we see a lot of conservative people, I would encourage anyone who speaks Chinese or speaks any language, you spend time just talking to your people and you're actually gonna learn more and change how you organize. I was transformed having so many hard conversations with um, people I thought were right-wing people, but they were just conservative and no one ever um, who was progressive or liberal even tried to talk to them. And, and if you do that over like 15 years, you know, it's like, you know, right now the Chinese Progressive Association, this will be my last point. The Chinese Progressive Association is um, 
doing a lot of conversations uh, called a deep canvas, like talking to people about public safety on the phones. And the whole point is not to try to get their vote or try to move them one way or the other. The whole point is to listen. <laughs> and you know, when you're calling people, they're so not used to it. They're just, they're gonna pick up the phone. Oh my God, you're gonna tell me to vote one way or the other. You're gonna say this and then like, no, actually we just wanna know how you feel. Mm -hmm. And so interestingly, from all of these conversations, 30% of the people were still saying things like, well, I know cops are not the answer. Like, I know that. And, but in some ways it's a little bit like, I know they're not the answer, but also I don't know what else is, is an alternative. Now that's different than saying, I want cops, right? And I think those are the, those are the nuances we have to understand in our community. Like I always tell people, you know, Chinese, the, the Chinese psyche is very sophisticated. Like if you go to China, like there are so many different opinions. Like when I went to China, I was like, damn, there are hella different kinds of Chinese, right? So, but in, in our society in the United States, this gets in the model minority stuff, we only see one version. So that's why even sometimes progressives, we think all of Asians are conservative, which is not true, right? And for the for the guidance counselor, it's like we need to we need to we need to show that there are other kinds of Asians for young people, even if there's just one Pam Tao Lee <laughs> or you know one Catherine. One you know you just be able to look. There are other pathways for you. you. Don't have to be a computer engineer. In some ways, I'm lucky that they diagnosed me as colorblind, which I am colorblind, and that disability knocked me out of math, <laughs> sciences, and engineering. So my parents are like. There's nothing else you can do, but do community. <laughs> and I'm like, I was lucky. I kind of got moved off that track, right? But but you know what I'm saying? It's like, I think we can, we can lift up these other voices. And that's why this anthology is important. That's why ethnic studies is important because we are literally breaking the model minority myth and we just have to keep doing it. I'm Kyle, Catherine, can I? There was yeah. a question that a counselor raised Yes. Um, do you want to read that? I, 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 I think that's an important one. Yeah, I'll read that out right now, actually. Thank you, Pam. Um, the question is, what advice would you give to counselors and educators as it pertains to empowering students and embracing their duality of identifying with Asian and American values as it informs their educational and life planning? As a Latina counselor in training, I find students are often in an in-between state of wanting to pursue their passions, but also honoring their elders slash meeting expectations. I see a lot of this in first-generation student experiences across various cultural identities. And it's a great question. Thank you, Pam, for pointing it out. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a, an exact answer to that, but I feel that this is really important. Um, and the young people at the Chinese Progressive Association did a study um, on this um, and, and mental health and, and the impact. It, it, it was conducted at Lowell High School, focused at Lowell, I think, uh, where there's a lot of pressure there. And I think that the, the information um, in terms of mental health impacts is, was, is very important and for to be able to get out there in the community. And, and then some of the young people started to talk to their parents about this. Parents, they, they were saying, uh, you know, uh, responding in terms of not a conservative parents with it. Well, the mental health is, is like, um, yes, it, it's, it's not like understanding from the student's point of view, um, but, but uh, I think it opens up a discussion that really needs to happen that Alex is really talking about. And the, the other thing I want to say is uh, when this comes up as a counselor, uh, as an elder, uh, I would advise you to, 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 to really encourage maybe the some of the stories from this book, but really encourage the young people to pursue their passion because we want our young people to be happy and to be able to um, really have a space in which they can make a difference in the world. Uh, and, and, but then help encourage them to be able to uh, talk to their parents in a way that uh, honoring everything that their parents have sacrificed for them. 
um, but also asking their parents for their confidence, that, that, that um, confidence in them, that they have raised them with common sense, with skills, uh, and, and uh, to be able to step forward. I know this doesn't actually answer that question, but this is something that I, I'm very concerned about. I think actually, I think that's great. And Pam, I one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking is there's the thing that's happening, the work that's happening within family and community, but there's also a responsibility too for educators to develop and, and grow outside of maybe their own lived experience, right? So for a lot of us who are working with students who are trying to open those doors, I know at Ohlone, one of the things that we've been trying to do um, is to provide professional development. The Linton Center's um, launched an inaugural series of workshops for faculty to engage with race in the classroom as a way to open up different kinds of dialogues with our students and help them to see some different pathways. Actually, Dr. Lee was one of the um, facilitators of these workshops. Uh, uh, she facilitated a workshop about using ethnic studies pedagogies and teaching writing. And I think across disciplines, and I think this is, this is actually something that's a responsibility for all educators, particularly in, in places like community colleges, where we have this incredible body of talented, amazing first-generation students and students of color who are coming to us hungry for opportunity and hungry for a chance to see different kinds of paths. Um, and so we as educators also have to learn how to participate in, in the, those conversations as well. Great, um, thanks for that addition, Kyle. And Pam, thank you for, for really bringing to light some of those mental health pieces too. I, I, they really are incredibly important. And Alex, I really loved your point about having those hard conversations. We're like actually taking the time to have those conversations that we all avoid because we all have people in our lives that we're like, oh, your views are different than mine. I don't, I don't wanna have that conversation. That's too hard to do. And I think really encouraging folks to do that and do that from a place of listening from a place of like being open to hear them as well. I think that that is just such beautiful, fantastic advice. Um, we, are, we are coming close to the end. So this is really gonna be the last question. And so I'm gonna combine it a little bit with something else, which is the question is, where do you see the future of Asian American organizing and or activism moving in the near future? Uh, what issues do you see as key for the next generation? And then I'm gonna add in, do you have suggestions for our students who want to be getting involved and are ready to get involved? And that is for anyone that wants to answer it. I know Pam, you took a stab at it already in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I would just jump. I it was like a long question, and I'm like, oh, um, maybe <laughs> the maybe the one the last part about what people can do. I have always just told young people to just find a squad or even a pair. <laughs> just find one or two other people to, to do mm -hmm. something together with, right? It could be reading something that, hey, it could be reading this book. <laughs> and, then, um, and then reaching out to us afterwards. Um, that's always something that is pretty easy to do. Um, it's like going to a potential action. Um, sometimes I know that's intimidating. And, um, and I know either one, like you can talk to us. And, um, and there are a lot of different organizations and I know that's what a lot of people say. And I, I think sometimes it's hard to know how to plug in, but I would just say like, you know, taking really like baby steps. And also um, knowing that, you know, let's say you, you want to do community organizing and you, you do some activism. You're like, oh, well, gosh, this is not really for me. We need people everywhere. We need lawyers, educators. We, we need um, people at every level. So I think just one big takeaway from this is like not everyone has to be an organizer, but you can be an organizer anywhere, if that makes sense. Like you can go into education and you can you can be a computer science, a science person. <laughs> Many, we need, have a lot of tech needs, you know, 
but the main thing is really finding other people to do it together with. Um, this is Pam. I, I did take a stab at that question and I just really feel that I know it, it may seem like a really big question, but our issue is climate change. Climate change is going to affect everything, everything, everybody, everything. And the capitalists are making money off of the climate crisis and working people and people of color are suffering the worst. And this is right, I feel, in terms of coming together, even from an Asian perspective, what, what is the climate change going to look like for Asians? It's food scarcity, the ability to grow rice in Asia is going to be cut back. We'll be able to, in a few years, they'll only be able to grow 30% of the amount of rice right now. What does that going to mean? Um, in, in terms of um, climate, the rising sea levels are, you know, our, our, our islands, our, our, our folks in Asia, and, and even here in San Francisco, um, the rising sea levels are going to impact where people live. For Chinatown, our sewage is tied to the sewage system. And if it, the, the, just in a couple of years, the rising level is going to impact the sewage in Chinatown. That means the sewage is going to back up in, in China, for, for the Chinese residents in Chinatown. It's, 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 and all of these different things from food security to, to um, where people live, the conditions, the fights that in terms of blame, you know, for, for things, I feel that um, climate right now is going to impact everything and, and including the issue of, of um, war for water things like that. So I know it sounds so big, <laughs> but, you know, just having like, a, you know, small group of people just start to explore what does that look like for our community? Um, yeah. Did you want to weigh in? Because I wanted to say something, but feel free first. Yeah, just just really quickly, I think to um to build off of what Alex was saying in terms of, you know, organizing can happen anywhere. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, it doesn't just have to take place if, if you identify as, a, as an organizer. Um, uh, education is changing, right? Like there have been significant shifts in the types of courses that the California Community College system, the CSU system is going to be offering because of um, the, the push for ethnic studies. Um, so I, I do think that we're kind of at this really interesting moment where, you know, over 50 years after the, the you know, the strikes at San Francisco State and UC Berkeley for, for ethnic studies and Asian American studies, we have kind of this, um, another opportunity, not that there weren't opportunities before, but we we're at a very unique moment in the education system where we're going to have um, an influx of ethnic studies and Asian American studies courses. And I think now there's really going to be a push to revisit some of those original visions from the ethnic studies and Asian American studies movement about what education would look like. And uh, something that was never really realized that, that really um, was lost was this connection to the community. How do we connect Asian American studies back to community needs, to, um, to urgent needs that, um, mm -hmm. that Asian American and BIPOC communities are facing right now? And I feel like this is the direction that, that it needs to go in. Um, ethnic studies, Asian American studies uh, often is now seen as kind of like a, like a book driven, um, thing that students study in schools, but it really had a community focus uh, at the beginning. And I think we have an opportunity to really um, highlight that uh, moving forward. If I can just weigh in super quickly, um, two things. You know, one is I, I really believe in the unity of theory and practice, as Catherine's saying. So read, study, right? Mm -hmm. And our book, I have to say, I'm not trying to make a shameless plug, but it really talks about different kinds of Asian American activism happening on the ground, and then organizations you can connect with. And then my second thing is, you know, try to find, I mean, I agree, you can start your own as well. The, the, 
the two are not mutually exclusive. I think there's also so much to be said, like there's seeding change, right? Activist training programs with the uh, Chinese Progressive Association that Alex was talking about, and the Chinese Progressive Association, the Asian immigrant women's advocates that Catherine also worked with. Um, there are many groups here in the Bay Area that are doing really good work. So if you know the kind of work that you're interested in, feel free to email me, but I'm in Santa Barbara. So um, Catherine, Alex, and Pam are all in the Bay Area and might be able to hook you in even more to different orgs that exist. But on our website, I just finally, I put it in the chat, our, the, uh, the website that uh, is attached to our book. It's kind of in development, so it's not fully there, but there's a list of organizations and you can check out the organizations um, that exist. Mm -hmm. So get involved, just try it, just jump into it. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Fugino. I wanna also just remind folks before Catherine closes us out, um, if you're a student and you know what, I'm feeling generous today, an Ohlone community member, faculty, staff, administrators, uh, even though you all make all that money, and um, <laughs> of course, students. Um, if you are here um, uh, with us right now, please email, you can email Lytton Center at aloni.edu. Um, we'll have you in the registration and we were we are happy um, to provide you with a free copy of Contemporary Asian American Activism. We wanna get this book out there and we want people to learn and grow and then go and build movements and build knowledge um, out there. And so I know that I've learned so much today and just feel so, um, I, I'm trying to describe this, I'm just like so ready and so um, motivated and inspired and I know our students are too. So um, please do reach out if you're interested um, in uh, this book, if you joined us here today. And Catherine, do you wanna take us away? So I, I'm just going to close out by thanking again, the panelists so much for all of your insight um, and sharing your passion with, with our entire community. Um, I do want to echo Kyle and encourage you, if you're in the audience, send us an email. We will gladly send you the book, um, Litton Center at aloni.edu, once again. And finally, I just want to share our next flyer for our final Litton Center event of, of this year, this academic year, which will be on May 10th from mm. 1230 to 2. Mm. It will be from Christian Sweeney, who's Deputy Organizing Director of the AFL-CIO. And it's called Innovation and Growth, Everything You Need to Know About U.S. Labor History in 45 Minutes or Less. Hmm. So I hope you will all mark your calendars for that event. Um, we will, of course, send reminders to the campus community. And with that, I'll say one more thank you to our amazing panelists and uh, wish you all a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Yes.